Well, hello everyone. Thanks so much for uh, joining us um, today. We are um, having a little bit of technical difficulty getting our uh, host uh, connected to our live broadcast here. Uh, so we're working on that. We will be with you uh, momentarily. Uh, need about uh, a minute more. Uh, so stay patient. I'm just going to put the countdown timer back on uh, for a minute um, and we will be broadcasting live. So we did, um, uh, on Skype. So hi everyone, you're actually witnessing live some, some technical uh, difficulties, but we did uh, actually get uh, Peter Marks to be able to join us here for uh, today's study hall. We're just working out one last little technical bit. Um, so never a dull moment in a live broadcast. Um, he is just getting his presentation up. Um, and uh, if you do uh, switch screens up there, uh, Peter. Oh, uh, yeah, so choose one of those. So here we are, both of us side by side working working through it. There we go. There's excellent. We okay. there. <laughs> so here we have it uh, live live technical support and live issues. Thanks so much for uh, tuning in today and being patient with us as we figure uh, this out. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Peter Marks, Master of Wine, who happens also to be uh, probably one of the world's biggest uh, Tour de France um, fans. Uh, so hence his background with uh, the writers in the background. Hey, Peter, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great, Christian. How are you? Doing okay, doing okay, yeah. Yeah. Sorry about the delay. Um, you know, in the Tour de France world, we had a mechanical issue. So, uh, <laughs> as, as you can see, I'm standing here uh, under the Champs Elysees and the Arc de Triomphe and hoping for the successful Tour de France. It is the start of the Tour de France, or it started on Saturday. It typically happens in July, but obviously with COVID this year, things got a little bit delayed. But they are riding their bikes, and, you know, here is the uh, map of the tour for this year. It's it's going to be a fabulous tour. Uh, 21 stages. They average over 100 miles a day. You know, some really intense category, off the charts category climbs. I mean, this is unbelievable athletic feat. I, people who do this, I think, are truly some of the best athletes in the world. Or they're probably the craziest athletes in the world, too. I mean, if you like crashes, we got crashes. If you like speed, we have speed. And one of the best things, if you don't, even like bike racing, if you watch the Tour de France on TV, I mean, the landscape and the 
beautiful pictures that they show. And they always do a little bit of background on, as far as, you know, the towns are going through and they give a little historical perspective. It's, it's just a joy to watch. And actually today they went through the town of Mont Monte Lamar, which actually is right near the Rhone River. They crossed over the Rhone River. And my wife told me that uh, Monte Lamar is the home of where they, may, they make nougat. If you like nougat, you know, it's that sugar and egg white stuff. And, you know, it's not my cup of tea. But I remember one year we went to France. My wife bought like one slice and it was like thirty five dollars. So I was like, I'm not buying that stuff. <laughs> I can buy a bottle of wine for that. So uh, given the fact that we're in the Tour de France and I'm a big fan, I decided to taste two wines today. Um, and I'm going to do it without a mask. This is the one of the tour leaders today who actually have. They're being very careful with COVID and they're taking all precautions. Um, and I hope you are doing all of that as well, all of you out there. But today I do have two wines I'm going to taste and I'll do it under the WSET level three systematic approach to tasting. And I'm gonna taste these wines or at least taste them with you blind so you don't know what they are. And after I post up my, my notes, I'll give you some options as to what the wine is so you can play, you know, guess what the wine is. So our first wine is a beautiful white wine uh, that I have here. Um, when I look at this wine, I think it's got a clear appearance. I hold it at an angle and it's actually got a little more depth of color than you might find for a typical, very young white wine. It's sort of a medium intensity and, and I would call that a lemon color. Medium intensity because the color itself goes more than halfway to the rim of the glass when I hold it at that 45 degree angle. And if it went all the way to the edge, that, that is what we call deep. And anything less than halfway uh, when I hold it at the angle would be considered a pale intensity. Now, when I give this wine a little swirl and a sniff, it's clean, medium intensity, not particularly high by any means. And I've had this wine out of the refrigerator for about 20 minutes, so it's not icy cold. It's actually about 50 degrees. Lots of primary aromas. So I'm getting some, some nice uh, floral blossom, uh, green apple, some grapefruit, lemon, lime, a little sort of unripe pear. There's some stone fruit character, a um, little bit of peach and some nectarine, but not really ripe, more like a white peach. And a little grassy character, maybe some fresh fig as well. Not dried fig, but like a fresh fig. And there's a hint of secondary notes, maybe some lees aging. I get a little brioche and some bread, a little nutmeg and vanilla, which indicates there might be some oak influence here as well. As far as tertiary, I get a, just the beginning of a little bit of that slight marmalade -y and hay character, but it's mostly on the primary, but there is some secondary or tertiary notes. Given that, I would call this wine developing. It's not just primary. There's a few other things coming into play. Okay, let's have a taste. And there you can see my notes for the palette. I call that dry. I always like to drop my jaw down after I taste the wine. And notice I'm not spitting it out because this, this tastes really good, I'll tell you that. Um, but when I drop my jaw down, that really accentuates the, the flow of my saliva. And I am salivating, not, a, not as a, what I would call a high acid, but this is pretty, pretty intense. So I would call this a medium plus acidity. Um, alcohol's medium. I don't get any burning in the back of my throat. And then body's got some nice body. It's, it's a little bit more than medium, but it's not completely full. So I'm gonna give that a medium plus body. On the intensity here, I get a little more intensity on the palate than I did on the nose. And oftentimes when you're using this systematic approach, I, I suggest to students that you recommend, I always recommend that you use the same level of intensity on the palate that you use for the nose. In some cases though, it may go up. And the reason it can go up is that, I'm sure many of you've got milk up your nose before, <laughs> in the back of our throat, there's that so-called retronasal passageway which is another way for the senses inside your palate to be recognized up in your olfactory bulb. So in addition to smelling through your nose, you can smell things through the back of your throat or through your 
will affect retronasal passageway. And I'm getting a lot more flavor in, in the palate because of that. So I, I think it could be a medium plus intensity. Flavors on the palate, I don't really pick up anything different. Let me check again. I certainly love to taste this wine again. Mm. There's a little bit more of that marmalade character on the palate. It seemed like it was more primary on the nose, a little more, a little more marmalade, maybe some fig really coming through on the palate. And then finish, very nice. Not 100% long, but close to that. So I will give that a medium plus finish. All right, given that this wine has really good balance, um, the S is nice and fresh. It cuts through some of those beautiful uh, primary fruits, gives it a little lift, and it also, uh, the alcohol is medium, it doesn't stick out. The body is uh, well-balanced and rich, you know, medium plus to give it some weight without being overly heavy or too light. And the finish is also really pleasant and lingering. So all of those things makes this a really good balanced wine. I give it a check mark also for intensity. It has just enough intensity, in, at least on the palate, uh, medium plus, so that gives it a check mark on the intensity. And by the way, I'm using the, the Blick formula. I should have mentioned that to begin. You know, Blick stands for balance, length, intensity, and complexity. And in WSET world, we use that as a measurement for judging the quality of the wine. So it's got balance, it's got some intensity, and it also has complexity. You can see there are quite a number of descriptors uh, for this wine. It comes up a little bit short on the finish. We have to have a long finish in order to get a check mark on the finish or the length. So it has three out of the four uh, attributes for quality, and that gives it a very good rating overall. And then we also need to address the suitability for aging. I think this wine can actually age. For white wines, I generally consider a three-year period. And over that three years, I think this wine is going to improve. As I mentioned, it's only just beginning to develop some of those tertiary notes. I think it'll really come on strong with a lot more um, richer notes. It'll probably get more honey. It might get a little more uh, dried figgy and more marmalade maybe a little bit more um, honey-like and possibly a little bit more nutty, some almond or hazelnuts. But this is a wine that, um, with its good acidity and good balance, I think it's going to hold up from a structural standpoint and develop additional flavors that will make it more interesting and more complex. So that's why I think it can age for three years or more. Okay, ready for the big reveal? Well, not quite the reveal, but for you to guess the wine. Uh, I have four choices, and obviously these are all from France. They represent different regions and different grape varieties. So uh, our guess for Condrieu, which would be a wine made from Viognier. Uh, wine choice number B is a Pessac Leonier which is a region in the uh, Grave area of Bordeaux, where they grow uh, white grapes, Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon primarily. Then we have a Pouligny Montmarché from Burgundy, made from Chardonnay. And then we have a Sauvignier from Loire Valley, which is made from Chenin Blanc. So Christian, I don't have my Facebook page open, so I can't see what's going on, but yeah. if you can right. let people right. guess and see what they're Okay, thoughts so, are about this wine yeah before yeah, before you gave the selections i asked the question what do you think uh, this wine is based on your tasting note and we had some people chime in uh white bordeaux chenin blanc um and then uh let's see now that that you've put up this selection um we have some more for uh white bordeaux um seems to be the overwhelming uh choice here, uh, choice b i think we're gonna have to make this harder <laughs> you are correct, ladies and gentlemen. This is a white Bordeaux uh, from Pessac Leonier. And as you can see there, this is Chateau de France. This is a wine that's a blend of Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon, 80% Sauvignon Blanc, 20% Semillon. And as is the case with many nice, high quality white Bordeaux, this wine has been aged in French oak. Um, the notes here show that it was aged for 10 months in French oak, and 30% of that oak was new. I really don't think I picked up that much new oak. I mean, obviously that's what the check sheet says, so you gotta believe them, right? But in any case, it doesn't seem, it, the oak does seem very well integrated into this wine. It just doesn't uh, stick out like a sore thumb. And I do believe that white Bordeaux is one of the 
at least one of France's most underrated wines, because these are wines that people just don't think about that much. We think of Bordeaux, we think of obviously red wine, but white wines, particularly from the, the Pesac Leonier appellation, are considered some of the finest white wines in, in all of Bordeaux and all of the world for that matter. And it's a wine that does have a beautiful capacity to age. For me, I really like a high quality white Bordeaux when it's around 10 years. It still has some of that primary fruit and it really develops a lot of the tertiary character. And with Sauvignon Blanc giving it good acidity, it's a wine that can age nicely in the bottle. So if some of you thought it would be Condrieu, just to give you a little thoughts why I think it would not be, um, probably Condrieu would have a little more alcohol, more body. Um, some producers use a lot more new oak, and it certainly would have a little lower acidity, probably medium acidity at best. Uh, Pouligny Montmarché, you know, with Chardonnay, probably you were you would not pick up some of the grassy and figgy notes that I found in this wine. Also, um, I would find a probably a little bit more of that stony minerality from Pouligny Montmarché. And if it was a wine that had a little bit of tertiary notes, instead of getting sort of that um, marmalade character and uh, um, and hay, I think, you know, I often get sort of hazelnut and almond and maybe mushroom uh, with white Bordeaux or, with, I'm sorry, white Burgundy and, and with Chardonnay. So those are the kind of tertiary notes that are more associated with uh, a white Burgundy. And then as far as Sauvignon, Chenin Blanc, that's, that's a wine that has acid that will rip your tongue off. <laughs> I mean, I would have, I would still be salivating right now if we had a Sauvignon. Those wines are really, really intense. And they tend to be, they can get kind of um, higher in alcohol because it's beautiful exposition. It's on the north side of the Loire River. So they get a south facing on a slight slope, which really is ideal for ripening the Chenin Blanc grapes. So Sauvignon at 14, 14 and percent alcohol is not uncommon. And yet it still retains that acidity. Um, and that this wine did not have quite as much acidity, nor did it have quite as much of that alcohol. All right, so there's our first wine. And now we'll go on to wine number two. And by the way, Christian, if there are any questions as we go along, please uh, don't hesitate to fire away. Okay, sounds good. None so far. All right, so this looks like a rather youthful red wine. Um, intensity for me is medium. The way I judge this, some people put it over a white background and see if they can see the letters on the paper. Or if you can see the letters, then it might be pale or it might be medium. If you can read the letters, um, then most people would say that's pale. If you can see the letters, but you can't really read them, that would be medium. And if you're not able to see the letters at all, that's considered deep. But for me, I can kind of see the letters, but I'm not able to make out what they are. So I'm going to call that medium. And also the color of this wine, it looks really young. Purple is a color I associate with very young red wines. And there's just a little bit of that bluish purple hue here, um, but it's also ruby. So I would suggest this wine could be identified as either purple or ruby in its color. Wow, this has got a really very fairly pronounced nose. Maybe not all the way pronounced. I'll call it medium plus. In fact, let me put my notes up here. Um, so it's clean, it's medium plus, lots of primary fruit, floral notes like rose and um, violet, lots of red fruit, raspberry, cherry, uh, strawberry, red plum. It's got a little bit of that slight herbal note like black currant leaf, maybe a little fennel, maybe a little licorice. Also some blueberry fruit and some black currant fruit. It doesn't smell overly ripe by any means. It has a real focused fruit, but it's not quite uh, a, like a jammy type of fruit by any means. Secondary fruit, um, it almost smells like a new, if you ever buy a new cedar chest, it smells like that. I'm not sure if that's wood or not. Or it's just the, the wine itself, but it seems to have a, a, a very fresh new cedar-like character. But it's, and there's no other secondary aromas that I can pick up, and I also do not sense any tertiary notes. This is a very young wine, and so I have to call this youthful. On the palate, as you can see here, it's dry, got pretty good acid, medium plus. Tannins are not particularly strong. They're in that medium, maybe medium minus, I think some people 
would say medium minus on this. I'm more inclined to medium minus myself, um, but medium would be appropriate as well. They're really fine grain tannins though too. I should say they're really uh, beautifully integrated. Alcohol seems medium. Uh, body's also medium. Flavor intensities again are the same as I found on the nose. So medium plus. Let me see if I can find any additional flavors. Mm. Pretty much the same. There's almost, there's a little stony character now, which I didn't pick up um, when I first tasted this wine. Sort of like a, a dark stony character. And then finishes, I must say, this is really beautiful. This is long. You know, for me, over anything over 30 seconds is what I would consider long. And I can still taste this. Yep, still going strong. So what do we find here? Well, we find a wine that has balance. Again, beautiful, medium plus acidity. Tannins are well integrated. They're finely grained. The body is medium with the alcohol being in the same level. So everything seems to be a perfect sphere. The fruit is be beautifully bright and fresh and, and you know pretty much uh, pronounced in the sense of or at least medium plus, which gives it a check mark. And then it's got lo lots of complexity, even though it's mostly primary. Look at all those descriptors. And I, I think I could probably add some more now that it's opening up in the glass. And then finally, it's got a long length. So it has balance, length, intensity, and complexity. It's got all four. We have to give that an outstanding. Now, the question is, can you drink this wine? It is really youthful. It's really attractive right now. It's, I mean, I would drink this any time of the day. Um, but you know, because of that nice integration of the acid and the tannin, I think it's got enough structure to hold on for another four or five years and maybe even improve a little bit. Because it is so primary, I believe there is potential to develop more tertiary notes. And with a wine like this, you're probably going to get maybe a little bit more savory. I think you'll find more, maybe some mushroom and more earthiness, um, maybe a little bit of leather, maybe some forest floor. Some of those tertiary notes, I think, would become more apparent over the next uh, four or five years. So I think this wine could age. So anyone have any guess? Uh, you may, yeah. may begin to put your guesses up there, but I'll put the four options here on the screen for you to decide what do you think this is. So is it a Bourgogne Rouge made from Pinot Noir? Is it a Brewery, one of the Cruz and Beaujolais made from Gamay? Is it Chinon in Loire Valley made from Cabernet Franc? Or is it a Cote de Rhone probably from the south of France, made primarily with Grenache, uh, although it could have some other varieties, but most Cote de are dominated by Grenache. So which of those four do you think this is? And while you're thinking about that, I'm gonna have another sip. So we did have some early votes in uh, from uh, some, some participants that said Beaujolais um, and uh, some others pre, pre you putting up your selection uh, said it might be uh, Merlot uh, as well. But now we yep. have um, uh, votes coming in uh, for Chinon, uh, Bruy, uh, as well, some uh, Bourgogne Rouge. Uh, so a little bit all over, the, uh, yeah. all over the place. Yeah, this is tough. I mean, this, these are all grapes, except for um, maybe the Chinon, which might have a little darker color. But these are all, you know, Pinot Noir, Gamay, Grenache. These are lighter color, colored red wines that... Um, I must confess, I often confuse them myself. So hit, let's see what the answer is. And it is, dun, da, 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 it is a brewery. And this is from one of the most iconic producers in brewery, uh, Chateau uh, Tivan, which um, makes amazing wines. Here's a picture of Mount Brewery, which is the Appalachian. Um, now, actually, the Appalachian of Brewery is sort of in the lower uh flatter slopes of this mountain. And at the very top, as you can see in this picture, primarily the higher part of the hill is the Cote de Brewery. You know, Cote means slope. So the Cote de Brewery is entirely on slopes, whereas Brewery is at the lower uh, parts of this uh, mountain. And the, again, great producer, iconic producer. Uh, Brewery is actually the largest of the 10 crews in Beaujolais and makes 20% of the entire crew Beaujolais produ uh, production on an annual basis. So the, this is a wine that I'm going to have for dinner tonight for sure. If some of you thought this was a Bourgogne Rouge, um, you know, it probably would have been a little lighter in color. 
I think, um, you know, with Bourgogne Rouge being a simple Pinot Noir from, from Burgundy, although there's some very good ones, um, it might have had a little bit of oak, maybe, maybe not, but it probably had um, just a little bit lighter color and maybe a little bit more floral character as well. Tannins on that wine, uh, Bourgogne Rouge, might have been a little bit lighter. Uh, if you thought it was a Chinon, I think that's a really good guess. You know, maybe a little darker color with a Chinon coming from Cabernet Franc. Really strong raspberry black currant character with Cabernet Franc from Loire, which is what this wine kind of has too. But I find that the Chinons also have a really um, focused, earthy, almost like graphite-y, pencil -y character. Sometimes when it's not a warm year, they get really vegetal, like green, be green beans or um, kind of that can be a little bell peppery as well. And then finally, if you thought it was Cote de Rhone, um, probably would have been a little bit lower in acid, um, very higher and much higher in alcohol, and maybe some, some white pepper, which is a sort of a signature aroma that I associate with um, with the Cote de Rhone. I'm, I'm sorry, I meant to show you this picture earlier. This is the, the hill of Mont Bury, where you can see the, the vineyards on all sides of this mountain. It actually looks a little bit like a, a, a relative of the Hill of Corton, with that little kind of haircut at the top. It looks like somebody gave a, themselves a home haircut as opposed <laughs> to going to their barber. <laughs> so there we go. Um, that's our two wines. And, you know, again, this is Tour de France month all the way th uh, for the next two and a half weeks. I'm kind of wearing my Tour de France shirt as much as I could without actually wearing the yellow jersey. I've got some yellow on with some green stripes in there. Yellow is obviously for the Meyer Jorn, the, the one person who's leading the tour. The green jersey is the person who is the uh, the sprinter. And then there's also the polka dot jersey for the climber. And then they have the white jersey for the new young rider as well. So if you feel like you want to be one of those people, go buy one of those jerseys and live vicariously through the Tour de France. Right. Any, any favorites for uh, for to win the Tour de France this year, Peter? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm... It's been a long time since uh, a Frenchman has won. So I'm gonna, I'm kind of pulling for Julien Alaphilippe, who actually was the leader of the last couple of days. And then just today, he lost his lead. He actually, when everybody finished, he thought he maintained his lead because they finished in a big pack. But he was penalized 10 seconds because he took a water bottle um, past the so-called feed zone. Mm -hmm. So there's very strict rules in the Tour de France. Like if you take a water bottle or if you get take a snack, um, outside of the time frame when you're supposed to do that, um, as he did, he got penalized. And, you know, it probably was an honest mistake. It wasn't anything he was doing on purpose, but it cost him 10 seconds. So now he's he's uh, slightly behind the leader. But, you know, the race doesn't really start until you go into the mountains. Mm -hmm. And the Tour de France always goes to the Pyrenees and to the Alps. So the best days are yet to come. Great, great. Well, we look forward uh, to an update maybe next week when uh, when we rejoin the study hall on Wednesday. Uh, thanks Sounds so much. Good. This was this was a lot of fun, and uh, you made me thirsty for uh, one of the Cru Beaujolais as well. So I think that's what's on on going to be in my glass this evening. Um, <laughs> just as a reminder, we are we will not be having wine trivia this Monday because Monday is a holiday for us. So no uh, no study hall uh, this Monday, but we'll be back on Wednesday, two o'clock Pacific Daylight Time, uh, for another instance of uh, study hall. Thanks so much for. Uh, joining us everyone some great uh, guesses um, and thanks so much for participating we'll see you again next week bye peter bye cheers everyone